Amen. What a great song. We, we want to make sure we do practice holiness, and uh, we are going to continue our series of Power to Be. Uh, today, the message is the power to be holy. Uh, it's a subject that we don't like to talk about in church, that God wants you to clean your life up. He wants you to lose some things. He wants you to confess some sins. We don't like to do that. But when we think of holiness, we always think, or I, I think, maybe you may not think about this, I think of a, a monastery with some monk living in the monastery, keeping himself away from the world. You know, you've, you've all seen that. Uh, and that separation from the world's evil so it becomes, by doing that, they become a more holy person. And uh, I, I think that's, that's how I think of it. I'm not sure how you think of it. Uh, I, it's a subject that really doesn't come up often in the church. That people want to be comfortable. They want to be satisfied. They want to have all their ills cured. But to, to sacrifice not doing something for the sake of purity to be the best you can be is not taught in church today. I read the story about a young monk who, monk who went to a monastery and he was uh, led to take a vow of silence. His leader said he could only speak once a year and then only two words. Year one, he spoke, and this is what he said, food, bad. So another year passed, he gets before the leader and says, okay, you can speak two words, what do you want to say? He said, bed, hard. A year passed, three, third year came, and he said, what do you have to say? He said, I quit. The leader said, you might as well, all you've done is complain since you've been here. <laughs> uh, don't quit. A lot of people give up on, on living a pure life. Hey, there's a reason why God put, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to cleanse us and heal us from all unrighteousness. There's a reason that's there. And the church today, and I, I think maybe there's a possibility, and I have a good friends of mine that I've talked to about church and what's going on in the church. I think that God is purifying the church, making us really be what we're supposed to be and live like we're supposed to live. And He's challenging the church to get our hearts right with God. We need to do that. We need to be right. And we taught this on Hebrews chapter 6 on Wednesday night, that God wants us to move past our sinfulness and move on toward maturity, to be a dedicated follower and believer and disciple of Jesus Christ. We need to create that. We need to do that. Uh, our Lord expects us to be holy in every way. I want to read the text. If you have your Bibles, look at 1 Peter. I'm going to read two different versions. 1 Peter chapter 1, if you have it. I want you to look, look at verse 13. And we're going to read down through 17. I've listed verse through 16, but I'm going to go down through 17. Therefore, it's amazing how often that's in there. Therefore, because of the, the hope we have, because of the peace we have in Jesus, that's what the there is there for. Therefore, with your minds ready for action, be sober-minded and set your hope completely on the grace brought to you as the re in the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the desires of your former ignorance. Don't live like you lived before you became a believer. But the one who called you, but as the one who called you is holy, therefore you should be holy in your conduct. For as it is written, be you holy, for I am holy. I appeal to you as the Father who judges impartially according to his evil work. You are to conduct yourself with reverence during this time and live as strangers. Now we'll read you another translation. Some of you may have read Eugene Peterson's work and the paraphrase of the scripture. I want you to see what he says about this text. Let me read it again. So roll up your sleeves, put your mind in gear. Be totally ready to receive the gift that's coming to you when Jesus arrives. Get ready. Don't lazily slip back into those grooves of evil doing just like you, what you feel like doing. You didn't know any better then, but you know better now. As obedient children, let yourself be pulled into a way shaped by God's life. A life of energetic, blazing holiness. God said, I'm holy. You be holy. You call out to God for helps. He's a good father that way. But don't forget, he is a responsible father. And he won't let you get away with sloppy living. And here's what I think we have going on today. We have a lot of sloppy living. We need to make sure that we get rid of the sloppy stuff that's in church. And God's purifying the church. He, he's pure. He said, today we need to confess our sins. Years ago, we had this guy, a wonderful, loving, fun guy who's named Jesse Sardui. Some of you may remember Jesse Sardui. And uh, his name really was J Jesus or Jesus. And so I used to brag and, 
And I'd say, hey, uh, one thing about Valwood Park Baptist Church is Jesus cleans our church. And he should clean every church. Can you imagine what would happen when we, if, we, if, if Jesus really came through and people turned their hearts and their, their minds and their souls back to Jesus Christ and allow him to clean up the church again? Can you imagine the revival and the restored, restored, power, restored power we'd have if we were clean Christians and we got rid of the sin and we confessed it and cleaned it up? Maybe that's what's going on through this changing of church today. God's cleaning the church and I want a pure church. I want a pure, I've noticed this. God tends to use people who have clean, holy lives. He didn't want to work through junk. He didn't want to have to look at worship as we're singing through a bunch of muddy water. He wants to look at people who are dedicated to him. So I want to just share with you just a couple of things I want you to put in your pocket. And this is not a long sermon. And if you let me talk fast, I'll make it even shorter and we'll be away from here. But at first I see there's the action toward holiness. Therefore, with your minds ready for action. The action. Get your action right. In other words, if, if you don't put it right here, you've got to make up your mind that you're going to live a certain way. Have you made up your mind? Are you going to live a certain way? I mean, holiness seems to be an archaic thing to our generation. And when we think of holiness, here's what I think of. I think of all the women wearing hair in a bun. Can I get a witness out there? I think, I think of long dresses that are, I'm not sure if I know my fashion. Do they call them sweepers? And so, but long dresses, I think, I think of of men wearing really shirts that buttoned all the way up. I do too. Maybe I'm part of it. I don't know. I, I think of people that, that are just refusing to act weird and refusing to go to movies, refusing to listen to music, refusing to act anywhere like the world, just, just, just be so separate. There were no, we're so heavenly minded, we're no earthly good. And what happens when that kind of church is the church is meeting together and everybody is so stiff and so sour and unsweet that it's not a fun place to be. We need to be fun. Listen, we shouldn't have to push people to step away from sin. Sin should make you, make you step away from sin. Confess it. In fact, if we look at the Bible, holiness is, is very much in the Bible. We, we look at it in the Scripture and has ideas of things that we see. Leviticus, the, the book of Leviticus is the most difficult book in the Bible to read. And let me tell you why it's difficult. Because you know what it talks about? Most of it's about you living a pure life and me living a pure life. But it's the most unread book in the Bible. Why? Because nobody wants to clean up their act. Nobody wants, nobody wants to hit at the altar. Nobody wants to change. We, always want, we all want too much. In his book, The Pursuit of Holiness, Jerry Bridges says three things about holiness. We need to get. He said our action towards sin should be more, it's, it's tragically more self-centered than God-centered. What does that mean? We feel guilty because we've done something wrong because how it makes us feel. We told a lie. We cheated. We had a bad thought. And we feel bad. But he said we got to change that. We need to realize that sin is not just against yourself. It's against God Almighty. Clean it up. We never say sin right, he says, until we say see sin is against God. People make all these excuses about sin. Then he says, secondly, many misunderstand faith and holiness. It does not come through Faith alone, but through personal discipline, and they're not willing to discipline themselves. You know, you know one thing I have trouble with. Can I can I get witness? You know, you, you know me. I've gained a little weight through COVID and all the changes. Five pounds here, not just here, just not even there, just here. And I'm not going to tell you where the here is. I'll tell you about the hereafter, but I'm not after telling you where the here is. Uh, I've gained some weight. And Sue is very disciplined. She likes to walk. We walked 20,000 steps the other day trying to, you know, just stay in shape. And she mows our yard and everything. She does. She's very disciplined. But, but, but I like to, to eat my meal at 4.35, 6 o'clock, maybe the latest 6. And then, I like to, and then I like to stage everything, whatever I eat. Don't eat too much because what I want is by the time 9 o'clock or maybe 8.30 hits, I want to be sitting in my chair with an ice cold Dr. Pepper from Chick-fil-A and a chocolate chip cookie. I was complaining about overweight the other day. Sue goes, I wonder why. <laughs> yeah. 
See, I, I, I want, I want to, maybe I want to leave some of that behind. I'll leave some, but I don't want to leave my cookies behind. And what is it that's got a grip on you? And I'm not talking about your weight. I'm talking about your spiritual weight. Are you trim and fit spiritually? Is there some sin dragging you down, making you weak and making you wander and making you be a, walk astray from Jesus? Get rid of that sin. Go on a spiritual diet. Then, then he says, Jerry Bridges, the wonderful author says, the, the real thing about the church today is nobody takes sin seriously. Nobody, it's, it's just a little sin. We say, well, it's, it's, I'm just, I'm, I'm as good as the next guy. I, I'm, I'm, I'm just doing the, and I'm just, I, hey, I'm just human. He said, get your minds ready. Solomon, the smartest man who had ever lived, says this, says this. It's the little foxes that spoil the vines. Those little sins creep into your life and bring you down. Those little sins will tell you you don't go to church. Those little sins will tell you not to be kind. Those little sins will tell you not to be forgiving. Those little sins will talk to you and speak to you and ruin the vines and ruin the vegetation, the growth of your life. Years ago, I heard a sermon in Falls Creek. It was a wonderful sermon based on Romans 12, 1 and 2. It's by evangelist Jay Strack. You may have heard of Jay Strack. He's a wonderful evangelist. And he had a, and the title of the sermon says everything about the sermon. Battle for the mind, battle for the soul. And we don't get our life right sinfully until we get our thinking right about sin. Let's get it right. Get it right. You know, we need to have the right attitude. And we, we haven't cleaned our act up until we see that God says, okay, now. Now you're clean. I love to tell the story about my brother. We lived over on Fitzhugh, over by Fair Park, and we lived in a duplex, and uh, we had a, one side of the, I didn't remember the people on the other side, half time, it was empty, what I, what I remember, that nobody lived there, but we had one side of it. One day it rained, my mom said, y'all go out on the porch and play. So Steve and I, I don't know where Mike was, he, he never got as much trouble as Steve and I did, we were connivers. And Steve and I were out on the porch, and we looked at, it had been raining, there was a big mud hole down below the porch and so he said let's go play in the mud now i'm blaming it on steve but i was part of it but he said he's the one that initiated he's so we got in the mud then he says let's cover each up with mud i'll cover you first and then you get up and then okay let's see how much mud we can put on our body now that's a kid that's what little boys do so we were out there i'm I, he covered me mud i got up had mud in my hair mud in my ears i had mud in my nostrils mud everywhere and so I had mud all over me. Then I covered him up, and I've got him up to his neck in mud. My mom walks out on the porch, and you know what she did? She said one word, and here's what it sounded like. Ah! In the Greek, it's ah! She said, you stay here in the mud, Jerry. I'm going to go clean your brother up. So I just soaked in the mud. I said, I'm already dirty. Might as well play. And that's what people say about sin. I'm already sinning. Why don't I just sin some more? I've already, I've already made the mistakes. Why don't I just go dig in deeper? Eventually she comes and gets me. And I guess she wore out the whole bar of ivory soap that floats in the, in, in the water because she got out a brand new soap for me and she had drained the water, clean water, in one of those, what you, those little tubs that sit up on legs. You know those kind of tubs that she had? She filled it up to the brim, throws a bar of soap in there and says, just sit there and soak a while. And so... I was there, it must have been 30 minutes. And so I said, Mom, am I clean yet? Am I clean yet? She looked in there and she said, No, I got to do some work on those ears. And then she went after me. I promise, I thought it was dental floss going through this ear to the other. She was cleaning the whole brain. She, I think she pulled that rag through it and went back and forth. I thought my ears were going to fall off. And so I, surely I thought, I thought after she had done that dental work on my ears that I'd be through with the bath. And I saw, I said, Mom, can I get out? No, you soak a little while longer. There's nothing that can clean you up than soaking into the Word of God. Get it into the Word of God and go into worship and get it on your knees, soak in it, and just see what the soaking in God's Spirit will clean your soul. It's a will every time. Am I clean yet? Not till God says you're clean. We proclaim ourselves as being right with God, but God doesn't say that. Our action toward holiness. Secondly, our attitude toward holiness as obedient children. The reason we are not righteous and holy in our life is we are disobedient people. People like to disobey. 
If you don't believe that, watch all the fights on the airlines. Watch all the people street racing. Watch all the people that do these terrible things in life. We live in a, an out-of-control society, and the church has to demonstrate being under control and being obedient. We are spiritually unfit. And Peter's prescription for holiness was this. Change your attitude. Change your attitude. He says, if our attitude is right, we'll be moved to doing some things. He suggests three attitudes. Number one, have this attitude. Have an attitude toward obedience. Don't say, I can't change. You can change. Change the TV. Don't watch that stuff. Change the music you listen to if you need to. Change what you're thinking. And, and I know this as a preacher of the gospel, that sometimes I can have very negative thoughts right as I walk up to the pulpit. Not necessarily sinful thoughts, but negative thoughts thinking about, well, what's going on? And Satan has a way of talking to you. And, I, and as the recent book I read, I love the book, don't give Satan a seat at your table. He's going to mess with your mind. He's going to tell you it's not important to obey. But he's wrong. God's looking for an obedient generation. Change. Change. Take a step toward obedience. Take a step toward conforming. The Bible says conform. And see, the, the Bible says we're not supposed to be conformed to this world. We're supposed to be conformed to be like Jesus. Are you living like Jesus? I read this story about a cold day in Chicago. This Christian businessman was walking along and and there's a little boy trying to make money on a cold Chicago day. And he was selling newspapers at a bus stop. And as, he, as the man ahead of him got off, he just kind of pushed the boy aside. And the gusty wind gusts and blew all the boy's papers right down the road. And the little boy started crying. And the man who was conscious Christian, responsible Christian, looked at the little boy and said this. His son, how many papers did you have? He said, I had 25. He said, how much would that be? And he told him how much. He doubled the price and gave the little boy. He said, you go home. And he wiped the little boy's tears away. And the little boy looked up to him and said this. Ask this question. Sir, I have a question. Are you Jesus Christ? He said, no, son. But I'm trying to do what he would do if he was walking right here. We need more people to be little Jesuses in the world. To do what Jesus would do when it comes to forgiveness and healing and, and, and restoring people. Pay the debt. Take a step away from your past. Everybody's got a past. Every sinner's got a past. Right? Every saint's got a past. We all have a future. Take a step away from your past. Allow, don't, don't allow your past mistakes to let you stay there. Don't rehearse. Don't remember. Just stay with it. Train your bodies, train your mind, train your soul. Philippians says, adopt the same attitude as that of Jesus Christ, who sacrificed. And keep your attitude toward God as an obedient attitude. The number one job you have and I have today is to walk out of this church saying, I'm going to live this week totally obedient to Jesus Christ. And when he says give an offering, you give an offering. When he says forgive somebody, you forgive. When he says tell somebody about Jesus, you tell somebody about Jesus. Keep looking forward toward holiness. Roger Bannister was the first man in history to run the mile in less than four minutes. He did so in May 1954. And the next month, John Landry of Australia topped his record by 1.4 seconds. In August of the same year, in Vancouver, British Columbia, the two athletes met for a historic race. As Bannister and Landry moved toward the last lap, the other con contestants were way behind. Landry was ahead. It looked as though he would win. But as Landry neared the finish line, he was haunted by the question, where is Bannister? Finally, unable to take the strain any longer. He looked back, and when he did, he tripped and faltered and stumbled, and Bannister surged past him to beat him and win the race. Landry said this, if I hadn't looked back, I'd have won the race. Don't let your past mistakes, your past history, your failures keep you from running the ways. Keep looking toward Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, and move toward holiness. And then look at, the, look at the acknowledgement toward holiness. The Bible says, But as the one who called you is holy, you also are to be holy in all your conduct. See, God doesn't give you a day off. 
Well, Sunday I'm going to clean up the body and I'm going to take a bath and get everything cleaned up and I'm going to confess my sins and I'm going to get right with God on Sunday. No, you got to get right with God on Monday. Totally right. God has called every believer to a holy life. This is not, by the way, this is not just the, what you remember hearing about the holiness church. And that gets really confusing and confusing to people. The holiness church talks about all the things you're not supposed to do. And they believe in the total sanctification that you'll reach a point in your life that you'll not ever have the sin nature. That's not taught in the Bible. Everybody's a sinner till the day they die. Here's the difference. We're forgiven sinners. God has called everybody to a holy life. Acknowledge holiness as one way to praise Him. Living a pure life is an honor. Is an honor. Brings an honor to God. When you live a holy life, when I live a holy life, when I love people and do the right thing and share my faith and act forgiving and be like Jesus, that brings glory to God. It praises Him. Stephen Charnock in the book about holiness says this, to deny Christ's holiness is worse than to deny His existence. And if we see His holiness, we should want to be like Him because the Bible teaches that we should look to Jesus. Our goal is to be like Him. Revelation 4 says it like this, holy, holy, holy. Back in Isaiah, the prophet said, holiness is what God is. We see him as holy. Exodus chapter 15, who is like you among the gods, O Lord, that's majestic in holiness. We need to get our eyes off of the broken church and broken people and broken ministers and broken ministries and get our eyes on God who's a holy, pure God and eliminate the excuses and say, we serve a holy God. Serve him. Serve him. The only response is the holiness is to be holy ourselves. If it is to be, it's up to me. Nobody else can live my Christian life for me. I've been really motivated lately by the people I've met who want to share their faith. And I think one of the things that we have to do is we have to stand up and share and tell others about Jesus. We've got to do that. To acknowledge the holiness of God is to cultivate a spiritual heart that we want what he wants. Now stop there just for a minute. What do you think God wants for this world? You think he wants the world to all die because of COVID? You think he, you think he wants to give up in the whole world? No. Jesus died for all the sinners. Here's what he wants. He wants people to come and be saved and be born again. That's the job of the church. Holy Christians have their minds set on the heartfelt desire of Jesus Christ. We want what he wants. We want everything and everything he wants. A small boy asked his 12-year-old son, what do you want? I want everything you want, son, dad. I want everything you want. I read about a small boy that asked his 12-year-old sister. During a long sermon, I haven't timed this, but it'll get too long, just wave and I'll quit. Maybe. He's with his 12-year-old sister, and he said, as the sermon finally ended, he says, now is it all done? She whispered, no. It's just all said. Now we must go out and do it. And that's what I want to say. Let's come to church to learn about God, to learn about purity, purity, learn about confessing our sins, and now comes our time. We go out and do it. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, Help us to see that our job is to live it, to be the kind of believer that expresses our faith and shares our faith. Help us to leave this place and not try to call attention to ourselves about how good we are. We're sinners, but call attention about how good you are. And if people recognize our moral levels of success, help us to say, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. Help us give glory to God. We commit ourselves to you. In Jesus' name.